Uh, it's actually today at 2.15 in Orchid A and B. And we have five, uh, five guests who come in to, to do that, some of whom are actually here right now. So I, I, Ana Velasco, okay, from Peru, right here. And but you're a guest, but not really, because you're really a member of Oxia, right? Okay. And uh, so, Shadow um, Gibbons from Mexico, from Los Alamos, the Tech, who is a regular member of Oxia, but he's now also joining, uh, has joined our international network of people, too. So that's terrific. And I don't see any connections that I'm going to be seeing. And Francisco, who's come in, he's in America, but he's been in Brazil for 45 years, so he's really out of Brazil. scholarship uh, 
providers of for futuro, contentes, etc. It was a marvelous report, and here we go. We have fabulous report. Not from Bolivia, but from Colombia. <laughs> we'll be in the round table this afternoon. So we just thought it would be nice to have some of that on the round for you. Uh, we also want to go ahead and we're going to do some presentations of awards. So I'm going to turn over to Guido right now on the presentation for the International Program Award. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's my distinct pleasure to present the International Program of Excellence Award. This award recognizes a program engaged in activities that promote the exchange and ideas of global significance. This year's recipient is the International Leadership Development Program at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies, and I know we have representatives here to receive the award. The program IDLP provides emerging leaders from a major Chinese bank, a comprehensive and multifaceted immersion in Canadian business practices, professional communication, and workplace culture. The goal is to prepare the professionals for international postings abroad as part of the bank's globalization strategy. Based on the successful placements abroad of the participants, the positive feedback from the participants, and the supportive comments from the mentors, this innovative program has achieved this goal through a creative combination of continuing education, mentorship, and workplace experience. The program is led by the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies in collaboration with the Rockman School uh, of Management, the Canadian Securities Institute, and industry professionals. A robust learning experience was created for these banking professionals. The learning experience expands their language capabilities and cultural awareness. It deepens their financial knowledge, offering them an opportunity to be recognized and grasp the fullness of their leadership potential. So it's my distinct honor to present this plaque to the team from the University of Toronto. Thank you. 
Language Institute in Syracuse. Uh, in her role, she is responsible for credit and non-credit, tied on numerous colleagues and campus-wide committees, and has budgetary oversight. She grew up uh, in Cuba, she's a refugee, um, came to Miami early on in public schools, but she spent summers in Europe, completed her uh, associates in political science at Stanford. For 10 years, she lived abroad in Australia, Belgium, Costa Rica, England, Scotland, Switzerland. As a result, she speaks English, Spanish, and fluent in French and Italian. She holds an MD, an MA in linguistics from the University of Essex, PhD in Ed administration from New Mexico State University. So that's your leader. Uh, it's a great background, and you see why she's been so amazing at leading, even though this is the year I've watched her be chair. She's, for those of us who know Joe and others, she's been the the chair behind um, all of us for, for years. There was quite a, a group of us, and I, I wrote to them when they were in Brazil, and I said, we're, we're nominating Jerry, and the uh, little letters just poured in Jerry. I'm not sure if they wrote them on the bus or, or where they did it, but um, um, this one is from uh, Joe Ugras, uh, who says, she has been a great colleague for many of us attempting to internationalize our continuing education unit. She has been a mentor for many individuals without a personal gain, with insights, and keeps everyone in the loop of international education trends. That's from your friend, Joe. Uh, from your friend, Dennis. Um, Jerry lives and breathes internationalism, and not just through her own exploits. She is the only person that I know, aside from Dennis Rodman, who has visited North Korea. <laughs> We live in a truly a global time, and Jerry's insights, her commitment, and her passion about international engagement have helped many other campuses embrace the world in the same way as her own institution. As a member of the delegation of the opportunity to observe Dr. Burley firsthand as strategic visionary who is committed to bringing a global perspective to each student and faculty member on our campus. We're not done. From your, from your friend, Joe Shapiro. Uh, I am most honored and pleased to be writing this letter in support of Dr. Geraldine de Burley, Senior Associate Dean, Syracuse University College. Her commitment to international education is truly genetic. As a U.S. citizen who is born in Cuba, Jerry represents the model international educator and scholar who speaks four languages, has studied, presented, traveled to, and worked in almost 40 different countries, and has successfully led international education innovations through a multitude of leadership roles, a quarter century of service. How did we win this award? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Well, um, that's like the formal part of, you know, he got Jerry. The, the story. And, and I can share some of the informal part. Not too but I'll be nice. Okay. Uh, I've known Jerry for I don't know how many years. I used to be back east at University of Connecticut and University of Massachusetts back then and for, I've been to California for almost nine, ten years now. And Jerry really does epitomize what we do in international education. Um, she has led many trips. She had, you know, I, as you know, some of the colleagues said, really uh, mentored many, many who came to this network. And before we became this uh, international network, uh, there was this Global Associates, and she was uh, the, the person, really, the spokesperson, so to speak, to, to advance the cause, to advance the programs. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know anyone who has more, you know, the passion, the, the energy, the, everything that she brings to the group. So Jerry, congratulations for your award. You, you absolutely, I don't know, as Sue was saying, I don't know why we got it last year, but <laughs> you, know, so you certainly you know, have done so much for the association. And we've been to many trips together overseas. And if you ever happen to be, if you haven't already, you know, if you have been, you know this, she knows restaurants <laughs> everywhere you go, any part of the world. She would find the best restaurant in that city. Without her, we would be wandering around Istanbul, wandering around, you know, in Hanoi. But Jerry was there, so she, she does that. 
And also, when she is on the street, you know, one of the things that I have always noticed about Jeremy is she goes above and beyond for the institution itself. She meets with alumni, she meets with you know, partners. Even if it's not in her portfolio, she's always advancing Syracuse University. Talking about every single department that, that there is, they have some bank programs too. Yeah. <laughs> and she talks about that. Uh, I mean, she, she really represents the institution. She, so as an association, she represents the association, the network that she does. So it's, it's my honor, you know, really to, to be here and uh, present the award. You know, she really uh, has taught me a lot. Uh, I've been fortunate to call her a friend. So, congratulations to her. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation of Busea, and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ana Velasco. I am the uh, past president of the network RECLA. RECLA is a red of continuing education for Latin America and Europe. I worked there uh, 10 years ago. And uh, now, uh, right now, is, uh, I am a president of Advice Committed. Uh, I'm going to talk a little presentation of our network. Uh, that I think that we can work together to win to win. And uh, I'm going to be in my uh, original language, which is going to be Spanish. I'm going to be so quickly, but uh, it's the presentation of that we worked uh, 20 years ago. Thank you. 
eh, en este caso eh, voy a presentarles lo de la Red de Educación Continua para América Latina y Europa, eh, algo muy pequeño, muy fluido, en la cual tenemos representación más de 60 universidades en la actualidad y estamos en 14 países de América Latina y Europa. Eh, nosotros estamos en Argentina, en Brasil, en Chile, en Costa Rica, en Ecuador, en España, en Italia, en Guatemala, en México, en Nicaragua, en Perú y en República Dominicana y en Uruguay. Trabajamos desde 1996 a la fecha. Uh, actualmente concebimos la educación continua como un aprendizaje a lo largo de la vida, la cual es complementaria a la educación formal, eh, tanto de, pro, de pregrado como de posgrado. Tenemos sistemas integrales de educación continua, tenemos sistemas integrales en donde hacemos una serie de procesos en los cuales integramos diferentes tipos y diferentes formas de organización universitaria. Acá, lo importante en este caso de trabajar de redes de educación continua, hemos visto que hay algunos beneficios tanto internos como externos, pero lo más importante que podemos tener en conclusión, y acá sí me interesaría mucho nuclearizar, es de que a través de RECLA trabajamos en aproximadamente 60 universidades en 30 países, hemos firmado convenios de colaboración que han sido muy sustanciosos y podemos trabajar este, en forma de cascada, trabajamos con otras redes tipo AU, que son de 186, 182 instituciones en 20 países en la región, tanto en América Latina como en Europa, en RUEPE, que es la red de educación continua de españoles en todo el sistema español, en Amesita en México y en Virtual Educa trabajamos en toda América. La ventaja actualmente es de que no solamente es el trabajo en redes, sino también la Cátedra UNESCO, la cual estamos trabajando con un proyecto que se llama Cretimpat. En los proyectos alfa, lo interesante también que estamos trabajando es de que hemos trabajado los últimos tres años con temas de aprendizaje a lo largo de la vida, aprendizajes para medir también los, la información de las instituciones educativas superiores tipo este, eh, todo para ver los rankings internacionales y luego la vinculación con el entorno. Acá lo importante es de que cuando nosotros trabajamos en redes podemos tener resultados concretos. Resultados concretos como cursos, pasantías, eh, proyectos internacionales, la cátedra UNESCO y la integración en la parte virtual. Esto es lo que nosotros vamos a presentar el día de la tarde, en la cual la idea es integrarnos a través de redes. ¿Por qué? Porque el proyecto en sí es de que podamos trabajar cosas que sean concretas. La integración y para podernos ayudar y ganar mejor es que en este caso trabajemos eh, pasantías, convenios de cooperación y podamos hacer esto sin ningún problema que sean, eh, por ejemplo, pasantías de gestores, de profesores, de docentes y también con diferentes stakeholders que en este caso son los eh, empresarios, el sector público privado y, y público. Actualmente estamos trabajando una cátedra UNESCO. La cátedra UNESCO está naciendo en España. La vamos a trabajar en todo el mundo, que se llama Creating Path. Y es una cátedra en la cual tiene por objetivo enseñar a los líderes del futuro a buscar y explorar nuevos mercados. Y a su vez que ellos mismos se desarrollen para crear una riqueza sustentable. Lo interesante es de que va a ser el piloto en América Latina y lo importante es de que va a ser en efecto cascada en otras regiones del mundo, tipo África, Oceanía, y esperamos que también se pueda concretizar algunos proyectos acá en la región en Estados Unidos. Eh, hay resultados de trabajar permanentemente en la red, tanto internos como externos, a diferentes valores agregados. En concreto, y para terminar, porque es bastante limitado el tiempo, tenemos cinco niveles de actualidad. La educación continua está migrando ahora a un concepto innovador y un cambio de paradigma. El cambio de paradigma es el aprendizaje a lo largo de la vida. Hemos comprendido en las universidades latinas y en especial en Europa que la educación es a lo largo de la vida y sobre todo empieza desde el niño hasta el adulto mayor. Tenemos impactos en las políticas públicas del Estado, en las propias demandas de la sociedad del sector productivo, tanto público como privados, en las partes tangibles e intangibles. A nivel de universidades, ¿cómo debe ser esta respuesta eh, con relación al entorno? Y además con otros actores de la sociedad. Lo que las universidades no darán respuesta, tendrán que realizar las otras instituciones, sean educativas o no, como en este caso ONGs, clubs o las propias iglesias o religiones. Y además es un reto para la persona. En el siglo XXI la formación va a ser integral y los cambios permanentes. 
las políticas al 2025 son los procesos de migración y las transformaciones y van a ser en tres áreas muy grandes, en la parte agrícola, en la parte de salud y en educación. Para el caso peruano, y esto es una realidad en la región, nosotros somos 140 universidades, de las cuales 76 son eh, con autorizaciones definitivas y 64 están en proceso. Mi universidad trabaja cuatro líneas de información, que en este caso es la formación, la investigación, las relaciones con el entorno y las propias gestiones. Nosotros desarrollamos actividades a lo largo de toda la vida en diferentes programas y diplomas. Algunos programas dan créditos universitarios, otros no. Y la idea en este caso es trabajar permanentemente con diferentes stakeholders. Nosotros los invitamos para que puedan participar en estas redes y sobre todo este, podamos trabajar una relación donde seamos complementarios y podamos ganar todos. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so let me go back to the envelope, which is um, if if you don't have a card, would you put your name and email on here? And if you do have a card, just put your card in, and then that way we'll have uh, we'll have a list of folks who who attended the international network breakfast, and we can come back and contact you uh, because we we're always happy to get more assistance uh, to do the things that we're going to talk about to find out the things that you would like to do as part of the international network. And that's the next part of our conversation. Uh, well, we can talk a little bit about what we did, what we've done in this past year. Uh, as you see in the leadership team, what's happened, a lot of the folks have switched roles. But we have a, a, quite a bit of succession of continuity uh, in, in the people who've been working already in the international network. Uh, uh, we had, uh, we, or, we did, start to organize a, uh, we did organize a trip to, to Colombia, uh, but what we did for that was that we opened it up to other associations. We opened it up to AIA, which is the Association of International Education Administrators. Uh, we opened it up to AIRC, which is the Association of, um, no, it's the American International Recruitment Council. I happen to be on the certification board. Actually, Jeet and Joe are also now on the certification board. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> we certify agents, international agents, as meeting certain standards. So by opening it up to a number of other organizations, 
we really got a very good representation uh, on, on the Columbia trip, and we'll be, we'll be talking about that. The other thing that we organized was the Washington, D.C. briefing, which took place in February of 19th and 20th, and we backed it onto the AIEA meeting, which had uh, about a, between 800 and 1,000 senior international officers. And the topic, we chose Russia and the Ukraine, we'll talk about timing, uh, and we had some fabulous presenters from the Brookings Institute, uh, Fiona Hill and Stephen Pfeiffer, Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer, who subsequently, after the presentation, we heard on NPR for the next two weeks. Uh, and uh, and it, that was a wonderful gathering. We had about 40 people and very intimate. And uh, it was really uh, very interesting for us to look at. Because part of what our interest for international network is, is to look at emerging trends, to look at markets that would be interesting for us as continue, in continuing education to be able to start developing relationships. Uh, I mean, with the Columbia trip, some people have gotten things going already within two or three months, which is fantastic. But often, a lot of these things really take a number of years. And as you look at, first of all, you have to work with your own internal administrators, you have to work with your own faculty, and you have to start developing those relationships. And once that trust has been developed, things can go great from there. Uh, so we were looking at, because of the Putin initiative, in which uh, uh, Putin had declared that he wanted five to ten, maybe more, Russian universities to, to be in the top 100 rankings by 2020, to do that, all right, that would mean that it, uh, Russia would really have to up, you know, upgrade its level of graduate education. So that is an opportunity for universities, that's an opportunity for continuing education. And that's really the thinking behind that. And a number of Washington, D.C. Uh, DC briefings over the years have really looked at that as the framework when we've decided about it. Next year, the, the D.C. briefing is going to back on to the FCA conference because the FCA conference is going to be in D.C. So it'll be in March as a pre-conference. And we met as a committee uh, earlier this week to think about, uh, we have to also check with Amy as in the organization of whether the pre-conference would be a four hours or maybe a whole day. Uh, the DC briefing normally has been uh, an opening speaker, actually an eminent speaker this year. We had Anders Andersov, who is the, uh, the chief economist at the Peterson Institute, which is a major uh, economic research institute based in DC, as the opening speaker, who had, who had been uh, the advisor to Few presidents, a number of presidents of the Baltic states, including uh, and also to uh, the Russian president uh, Yeltsin at the time. So, um, so that pattern of our DC briefing, which is opening speaker and a dinner, or dinner and then the opening speaker, and then an all-day presentation with lunch, uh, has been our DC briefing. Uh, the discussion which we're opening up is that in a pre-conference in a you know, that probably is, that's probably too much to be able to pull off. So we have two topics there. One is what would be the topic or area of concentration for the DC briefing next year. And the, there will be a network, international network uh, retreat, what's well, actually, the networks are meeting in June in DC. Uh, and usually by that time, things will be finalized. But we do want to open it up to all of you for suggestions as to where you think it would be emerging trends uh, that would be an interesting, uh, interesting and, and kind of, in a sense, niche market for us to be looking at. And the idea of the briefing is that we get broad, well, first of all, we get the broader picture, what's happening economically, what's happening politically in the country, and then also what's happening in, what's happening in higher education. And usually we also have some programmatic examples. We have somebody come or a couple of people talk about programs that they've been running. So we, we have a big framework of what the setting is and then actual some practical applications of the programs that are going on in the country as examples for people to be thinking about what they could do. We usually also have people come and talk about funding opportunities, what are, what are the scholarships, what's going on, what's accessibility to that. So we also work with the State Department or the uh, different organizations. In, actually, in Washington, we have the American Councils on International Education because they've been, for, they've been working in Russia for a very long time and are, are privy to a lot of information about funding. So 
those, those are the kinds of things we've done for the Washington briefing. And that has kind of been absorbed. I mean, this is something that the Global Associates did for many years, and it's something the International Network has now taken over as of this year. <laughs> this year. But uh, I think it's something we want to continue to do uh, and to offer. So as a pre-conference, that's open as far as you know, how much can people take or want to be an active of. Often in a pre-conference, there are other things going on that people also want to attend. So we want to think about we want to think about that. We're not going to settle it in this, but I would be interested in opening it up to the floor. Number one, about regions or suggestions, which we can take some notes on, and also on the formats, whether you think uh, four four hours, and then decide on how concentrated that can possibly be, as opposed to an all-day exercise. And I'm opening it to the floor. There's been a lot of attention to Asia, of course, over time, but there are still uh, each year countries that become more interested in this and all of these mobilities. So a country like Indonesia doesn't always get as much attention uh, compared to the you know, major streets of Asia. towards the West for part of its education things, but it's one possible mm -hmm. perhaps this that And there's the whole scholarship program from the foundation. Now the Sapporna Foundation uh, is funding is actually funding full rides for students. They're doing a they have a relationship with a Texas University's uh, Texas uh, junior college that set up a campus in Jakarta for two and they're doing their associate's degrees there in English for two years. Uh, and it's accredited by WASPs, and then those students are transferring to U.S. institutions with full sponsorship. Uh, so that's very attractive, and actually the support people were there uh, in, at AIEA uh, to talk about that, so that's certainly an opportunity. They, they've come to our campus, the university parties, they actually bring um, high school students, and so it starts that early, that the to be 15 to 18 for university can be its own challenge. Other suggestions? Who wants to do something? I think you know we've talked about it a little bit, but uh, if we want to do a shorter uh, uh, conference event, and maybe we can focus on an issue or um, topic uh, rather than a geographic country or area. For example? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, uh, international scholarships. Okay. What's available, you know, we can talk about what's available in Asia and Latin America. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Sue? Well, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with and I think their whole building of the HI campus and the four new campuses that they're building, um, a lot of you have built research. They have 50 universities now consulting with them and helping them build this campus. And I think that's a very interesting process of what they're doing. Okay. As I said, we're not going to settle it today, but it, you know, we're open to suggestions, uh, very open to suggestions of what, what possibilities would be that people would be interested in doing. We have, you know, we. The thing is, there are always new people coming into the network. You know, coming into the network. So, so those of us who've been doing things for many years, the idea, something what we're talking about, is being able to mentor and being able to inform uh, the membership as a whole. A lot of people who come to the briefings are not part of the international network, or we're not part of something, but we're interested for their own for their own benefits. So that's certainly the case. Anything else there on the pre-conference? And what about formats? Of you know, of, as we go back to Amy, or as Dennis goes back to Amy, on uh, wanting a full day uh, briefing or just a half a day. There's a thought in there. I see. I see that I'm behind thinking. I think I have to work. Yes. Okay, no suggestion. Well, I don't think it hasn't been determined.
determined yet, right? Oh, okay. So the the Centennial Committee is working through all of those situations. Um, we have the conference used to be another day, right? So it's already one day less than it used to be. I don't think we're going to lose any more time, but it's balancing <coughs> the special opportunities that the, the Centennial um, brings to us with all the needs of the membership and the networks and the regions. Um, but by June, all of that will be settled much more than, than it is right now. Gary, if yeah. the format stays the same, you could start earlier than the three conferences this year really were about two and a half hours. You could start at eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that the, the, I guess my my real concern is that I I'd like to see pre-conferences to be substantive, um, not as we say in Spanish, go picas, little drops. So to really to really come away with something, and sometimes when there's not enough time, you really uh, you get a lot of general stuff, but you don't you don't get enough takeaways. And the problem also, as you know, in any conference is the degree of knowledge that the audience has. So you have people who come in who have a lot of experience, who are really looking to get something new, right? Uh, not, just, not just be affirmed in the information they have, but really learn something new. And then you have people who are new, who for, every, for which everything is great because they don't know, they don't, have, they haven't had the experience, and you have people in the middle who, you know, who are also looking for something substantive. So it's it's always uh, when you're organizing presentations that you, that you're able to provide that, or at least in the descriptions that you offer to people, they understand uh, what is being offered and what is not being offered. So that's 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 really a, a big part of what we want to make sure. Uh, as someone new to uh, RCA, yeah. uh, I, I do want to say that trends mm -hmm. are, are, are helpful as are best practices. Mm -hmm. um, and you can pick up that from so many different uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. But a slight logistical uh, issue, just something to, to think about. Uh, when I was trying to book to, to come to this conference, yeah. there were no hotel rooms for the night before. Uh, and so it, it made it difficult to, to think about coming uh, that extra day. Right. Uh, so I actually had to arrive. I couldn't get here until one yesterday because there was no hotel room. But I, you know, so just, just a slight logistical issue. Um, because if you make it hard to come, uh, I'm less likely to come. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suddenly off topic. But it's, uh, no, no, but, it's but, but, for, piece for the room, right? for the, it's being heard in the room, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fine. Uh, DC, of course, will be, in, in a sense, uh, it's an easier city uh, because even because of the public trans the transport is you know, here. It's, you know, you're, you're on a peninsula and it's just up and down, so it'll be it's a little bit easier to do that. But also, the more the more we can settle, if we can settle everything by June, then it's then we as a network can also market the pre-conference way ahead of time, okay? Uh, so that people can can plan on it because that's the other part is there's an additional cost to these pre conferences and uh, so that's also often a consideration for people so so if people are going and again if you're going to pay for a pre-conference you want to make sure that you have the added value as we say in continuing education to make it worthwhile uh, that you really get some substantive information so so certainly trends is something we're looking at and we've got folks who you know whose, whose job is to be looking at trends uh, making eye contact with Terrence <laughs> yeah and then best practices Sure. Yeah. It's in the centennial idea, mm -hmm. looking at the past and looking at the future. So we can, the past is very different. So it would be good to have a dialogue about where we've where we been and what we expect things to be in terms of international continuing aid. What are the emerging countries? So we can think maybe series of presentations okay. about different countries and what are the emerging issues. Have, of course, what does the past have in the future? So a broader, a broader scope. I don't know if you're in Washington, D.C. Well, the nice thing about Washington, D.C. is that there's so much talent there 
Uh, and we found for the DC briefing, I mean, I asked all these incredible people to come and speak, and they came, and we didn't have to pay them. So that really kept the cost down, because we weren't, we weren't paying for travel costs. We gave them I brought them special chocolates from Syracuse. <laughs> you can't pay yeah. most of them anyway, yeah. because of who they are. Yeah. So. But, uh, so, at any rate, uh, in that case, that's also, that, that helps a lot. Uh, because the pool is enormous of the talent that's there in DC, extraordinary talent to come and talk to us, so that's great. Okay, any other thoughts on that? So that, that would be one activity for, for us as a network. Uh, the other, the other thing that's out there is what are, what are the other kinds of things that you would like to get from the network? We're, we have over the years, uh, we, have a, uh, we have actually over this past year, put information into core. Uh, there is a problem for us in that, uh, and SOMA has been doing that this past year, that uh, the buckets in core, we can't control how the folders themselves, so we have to ask to get the folders created before we can put them in. And so it, it uh, makes it a little difficult sometimes. Uh, when we were preparing, before we decided on Colombia, in the last year's meeting at this time, there were a number of countries, so we had people talked about Chile and Peru, etc. And one of my jobs was, which I gave to some of my office to do, was to do sort of research on each country, uh, to do a kind of spreadsheet about the countries. And we put that into the course. So it's kind of sitting there under South America. But it's a little bit hard to work with that, and uh, we've, we've made that, you know, we talked about it and we're looking at it. Uh, but certainly uh, as a referent of information, of uh, sources, we have also a series of links. We actually have a, a sort of annotated bibliography in core, uh, of so links of the many international organizations and some little description of that, and that's sitting in core as an information source. Uh, before that, it was sitting, and Joe set it up in Google Docs while there was that going on, so we, were, we had it there. Uh, so that is something we have done over, over the years as a source. I don't know what else you would think, what, what other things that, and there have been discussions about some webinars, but we haven't discussed what kind of topics. Uh, some of the networks have been doing webinars. Uh, maybe that's something else on best practices uh, type of thing, which, which was just mentioned now. Uh, to have some of our, because we have a lot of expertise <coughs> within the organization itself, and of course we have a lot of uh, colleagues that are not OCEA members who have a lot of expertise who could contribute to something like that. Very good. Uh, it's important that the that international consider writing for the centennial booklet. Mm -hmm. I know you did volunteer to do that, but I just want to say it out loud. I don't know that people know you volunteered to do that. Um, they will know. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> And then, um, as we reinvent share into OCR review or whichever, to begin to think about how to contribute to that publication as well. Um, so one of the discussions in the roles of the, the different roles of the associate chairs in the in the networks is the idea that the person doing research and emerging trends uh, should have a very active role to play as, a, as an editorial representative to, to the new publication. Uh, but that was not part of the job description when we first did this, so we kind of, we're just, we're leaving that a little bit to the side right now uh, as, an associate, as, a, as a leadership work uh, to, to talk about. But yes, I have volunteered uh, apparently, I'm the only one who volunteered to put something in for International into the Centennial publication. And it's not a fully formed thought, but I was thinking of talking about, um, and actually this is a great group to start with, I was going to do several things. One was talking about, or discussing, how so many deans and directors and vice presidents in continuing education also have international as their portfolio. I mean, Jeet is a great example. He's VP for International and then the Dean of Continuing Ed. Joe now is uh, the, the Dean for professional, st for professional Studies and has International. And that's a very common title that we're seeing. So I wanted to do, number one, was to survey the, the folks, or just even count, really, how many have that as part of the obvious part of their portfolio. Other people have it as their portfolio, but it's not part of their titles. 
But that's just one part. The other, the other thought is for me and my idea, which I think is that the, the skill set that you need to be good continuing educators, right, and administrators, is also very much the same skill set that you need for international education. So I'm kind of thinking about the kind of competencies that you need to have that are kind of parallel for that, and I want to articulate that. So I was going to share my woes with my, my colleagues and friends to be able to maybe enrich this as a document. So that was one idea as part of the sort of international contribution to the document which um, Bob Wittenberg and Dan Shannon are the editors of, so they're pulling it together. Uh, but if you have other ideas, then there was an oh, there was some, uh, there was a call for it. And that you have something else that you, you think would also be good, Cyrus? Uh, yeah, I was talking to Bob Wittenberg yesterday, yeah. one of the editors, and he told me that they're thinking about uh, getting more uh, articles and more material. Maybe the print version would be more limited, but then they would put everything online. Okay. So it would be an expanded version online. So they're uh, better uh, uh, receptive to getting uh, more contributions. Right, by July. Yeah. So that's the only thing, and we're almost in April. <laughs> it's a good point. We'll have to. I am not the editor, <laughs> but we can certainly ask. Yeah. So there's, but there's two. Com so for share or for Obscure review, I think the possibility of doing things in dual language is very exciting. For the centennial publication, I think it's more limited, and it's just more limited. But forward with our journal, yes, I think that's phenomenal. One, one thing I'm clear about is each institution probably has something international, but we all do, we all do different things. Mm -hmm. Some of us do English language training, some of us do executive training, some of us do high school work, some of us do you know, It would be interesting to, to make a list of the type of things mm -hmm. that a continuing ed unit does that mm -hmm. is connected to international. Yeah. What are the different kinds of things? And when people read that, they might get an idea, oh, this is something that we can do, or this is, doesn't fit to us. So maybe some people don't know all the possible things. When we were doing the survey, we found that there are so many things people do uh -huh. for international education which are connected to continuing education, yeah. and we don't even know, I mean, no. yeah. but those give uh, an idea that what could be done. Yeah. Is that, is that I, survey material? useful for yes, I, I, so I did this last year so we can pull on we've got only like two minutes left so I want to stick to the time but do you want to talk a little bit about the so the bottom line the, 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 the findings um, actually uh, what we found is uh, one is that what people want uh, uh, the first thing is professional development and webinars was one of the main things uh, that people wanted and also we found out it's kind of a, a demographic uh, getting information that what people do, and that uh, actually is related to what you are talking about, uh, Joe. Uh, that it's not just uh, um, international education for a stu student exchange or study abroad or anything. There is uh, pro executive education, uh, professional education. So there are many things that we found, and I would be happy to send it to everyone again, the survey results, or put it in the core, and uh, it's on the core, I think it's, it's on, on the core. core. But uh, send an email to everyone so that uh, you know then where it is and how to find it. Just to add on top of that, sure. what would be very interesting to, to read uh, from, from those uh, institutions who have sustainable, uh, long-term success uh, in international education, it would be very interesting to have an understanding of strategy because, you know, in, in many cases, international education is more, uh, well, you know, I met this person on my trip to Colombia. And, you know, Serendipity you know, really like versus strategy. <laughs> that would be a beautiful, uh, a beautiful title um, because in, in some cases, you know, you, how do you create your strategic plan uh, when different things are happening in different countries at different times? Um, and, and often it is about uh, serendipity. How do you prepare yourself to be receptive to what the market 
uh, is demanding. Uh, you know, China is what Chinese people take up, you know, one fourth of the world. Um, so there are lots of opportunities there. But and one fourth of the population of international students are in the United States. Exactly. Right. So you know, does that mean that we focus there as a strategy? Yeah. How do you how do you establish your strategy right. to be sustainable? Is, is I think really um, a question I'd be really interested in hearing from. Okay. Others. Okay. It's great. There's a hand in there. Yeah. Sorry. from State Department people or Department of Commerce people or I know we've done some of that in the past, mm -hmm. but I found it very valuable, not just in-country experts, but uh, those who ha have a specialization in education and mm -hmm. Yeah, with a broad, a broader you, Sure. And this is just the first one. It's still the topic, but I just wanted to bring something that mm -hmm. I noticed and it must have brought my attention. We have a guest from Chile. And uh, her English is limited. Yet she wants to participate. And the first thing she did when I thought it was interesting was she went and asked, Do we have the interpreter headphones? Right. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Yeah. So people are talking, but once again, we, the assumption is that everybody's the same age. Right. That everybody, people are going to open it to other countries that are not English speaking. Right. And she considered that. that uh, Yes, and those of us who attend international conferences always we are, I always see that that courtesy is extended to non non whatever speakers. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, we have we're really we're really out of time. I, is the envelope going around? Oh, okay. We don't have to make sure that make sure we have your card or your name and if your interest. Thank you so much.